look around and see goodness everywhere. In art, in architecture, in beauty and sacred silence, On the Road with the Sisters takes you around the world to experience God's presence among us. It's a visual pilgrimage of the human story to seek the divine in all things. Come with us and discover the many spaces, places, and people who inspire all to seek the grandeur of God. Welcome to On the Road with the Sisters. I'm Sister Teresa Benedicta. And I'm Sister Martin Therese. On the road today, we'd like to travel with you to Detroit, Michigan. Detroit is known for its industries, the all-American cars, um, the rise of the little man to the top to, for victory. And so it's kind of appropriate then that today we're going to visit the shrine of Blessed Solanus Casey, who was canonized at Ford Field in Detroit. Now, sister, this is shameful, but um, I grew up just on the other side of Canada. Well, not on the other side of Canada, but you know, I mean, on the other side of the, the Detroit River. Side, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Solanus Casey was literally probably an hour from my home. Yes. I mean, obviously I wasn't alive, but um, but I really don't know that much about him actually, except from the footage from his beatification, etc. So maybe you can kind of give me a little bit of because we went and saw everything, yes. but I don't necessarily know about everything that we saw. Well, you know, what we didn't get to see is actually really important, too. So he uh, came, well, his parents were Irish immigrants. Okay. And they came over to the United States, both as young people, as a result of the Irish potato famine, and came to the United States in hope of a better future. Ellen and Bernard, Slaz Casey's parents, mm -hmm. met each other when Ellen was 16 and Bernard was 20. And it was love at first sight. And Bernard <laughs> knew that was the girl he was going to marry. And he proposed to her. And Ellen's parents went, no way. She's too young to get married. And they immediately found a convenient relative several states away. Now, did she want to get married to. to him as well? You know, I suspect the answer is yes. But okay. don't know that part of the story. Okay. Uh, but in any case, she gets moved to another state. And Bernard waits till she turns 18 and then tries writing. And he wants to keep up that relationship. But the letters aren't getting through. So he goes to his parish priest in Boston mm -hmm. and explains that he's in love with this wonderful Catholic girl and could he recommend him. And so his parish priest in Boston writes her parish priest several <laughs> states away and the two priests get them reconnected. <laughs> and at that point, the family realized this is a match that's meant to happen. That's really funny. Um, so their parents married. His parents married right during the Civil War. Um, and they had several children and then eventually decided to move out to Wisconsin and start a farm. And uh, Blessed Solanus Casey was uh, born in Wisconsin on the farm. He was the sixth of 16 children. 16 children? 10 boys, six girls. Oh my gosh, did all of them survive? You know, two of the daughters died one year where the family got diphtheria. And okay. actually, Blessed Solanus had diphtheria too, and his voice was always a little uh, raspy and, and weak. As a result, he, he had a kind of a speech impediment because okay. of that. Um, but two of the, the daughters died, but all the others, all 14 of them, made it to adulthood. Okay, so two of his sisters died... He received it, but did not die. Right. So he he makes it through. Okay. And what's interesting, like even though, you know, you think about, gosh, what a hard time to be alive. Mm -hmm. In many ways, his childhood, the way he describes it, it sounds almost idyllic. And and the kids always spoke about that time on the farm as just such a wonderful, wonderful memory. And I don't know if you remember in the museum, we actually saw a photograph of their family all together. Oh, the yeah, 50th. that painting. It was yes. All, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that it was at the 50th anniversary of their parents. And there's a fun story at that anniversary. Um, they were talking about the farm. And, and one of the kids said, gosh, I wish we could go back to those days. And without skipping a beat, the mom replied, thank God it's over. Because <laughs> she's thinking 16 kids, no right. electricity, life on a yeah. farm, wondering how ends meet. Right. Um, it, was, it was hard. Yeah. But what the kids remember was the love, wow. like how loved they were. It didn't matter that they didn't have anything. Right. They were loved and they, they yeah. felt that and, and, and remembered it. Now, and that, did she homeschool all her children or did they go to school or what was that like? Well, they went to school, uh -huh. but they're farm children. So you go to school when you can. Okay. So their education was patchy, particularly when they're when they're all on the farm. Okay. And Solanus, even though he was the sixth, still one of the older ones. Mm -hmm. So he was often pulled. Okay. Um, and actually, when he was in high school, he even uh, was sent for a year to the big city 
um, where he worked in the sawmills for a while. Um, so that meant his education came as it could. He right. was actually 17 before he uh, graduated from the eighth grade. Was he always a very virtuous young man? Did he have, I mean, what was his personality like and in terms of living the faith? And you So, know. you know, when guests come to your family, there are always stories your family tells about you. Absolutely. Blessed, so are you going to share those with bless, us? Bless, Blessed Solanus had those. Oh, good. Um, they would always tell about the time he got really angry at his sister and threw the fork at her. Oh. Um, and big, big trouble for throwing the fork. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Solanus would even say he struggled with patience. He struggled with self-control. Um, so so <laughs> he, he wasn't, a, wasn't a perfect kid right. by, by any means. Right. Um, he played baseball with his brothers. They formed their own baseball team. They called themselves the Casey Nine. Oh, and And Solanus was the catcher. But he um, wasn't a very big guy. He was... I mean, plus as long as Casey, I mean, at least the pictures, it seems like he was kind of petite. Yes, yes. Yeah. Which is actually kind of interesting, sister, too, because one of his first jobs um, was as a prison guard. Oh. And he actually was the prison guard to the Jesse James gang um, and became good friends with one of the members of the Jesse James, James gang who How made cool him a wooden chest that he took with him when he entered the monastery. And that's one thing I wanted to see when we were there, but do you know what happened to it? You know, he actually kept it for a long time, uh -huh. but as he got older and was being transferred back and forth, it was one of the things he got rid of in detachment. Oh, so that's too bad. So as far as I know, we, we don't have that <laughs> okay. chest anymore. Yeah. Okay, so he's working as a prison guard, um, got to know the Jesse James gang, and what else did he do? Because he had some other jobs too, because there's one job, what about the trolley Yes. Because that yes. was kind of a, so, a so, shift for And him. actually, the trolley was a big deal because electricity is just coming to the United States at right. that point in time. And he's one of the first people that learns how to drive the electric trolley cars. Wow. And that was a nice job. Yeah. And in fact, it paid so well, he convinced his family to leave the farm in Wisconsin and to travel to the city and get jobs in the city, which they did, which enabled the younger children to have a, a slightly better education mm -hmm. and a more stable life. But in any case... Um, he was driving these trolley cars through the city, and when he was 21, he drove into a really rough section of the town, and he witnessed a murder. Um, he saw a drunken sailor stab a woman repeatedly, and the police came pretty much right away, but by the time they got there and established the peace, it was too late, and the woman died on the tracks. And Solana said that was a defining moment of his life because it was the first time he really encountered violence and suffering. Mm -hmm. um, there was struggle in his life, but not not brutality. Yeah. And when he saw it, it shook him to the core of his being. And he and he later said he felt this call from God, what are you doing about the suffering in the world? Yeah. And he felt God asking him, be a priest, be a witness of another way, be a witness of the cho the choice to love, be a witness of someone who's completely dedicated to service and to giving one's life to the building up of mankind. And he knew at that point he wanted to be a priest. Was this an audible voice for him or do you know? Or is it just like it, through his prayer life, just knowing God's? You know, that's a good question. Because um, later in his life, he he did sometimes have audible voices. Really? Um, I don't know. It's something we all dream I don't of, know. you know. <laughs> yeah. God, just tell me what to do, you know. But he, but he, he, he knew at that yeah. point in time. Okay. And so he applied to be a diocesan priest at the German seminary, which was what? But he spoke English. He spoke English. He's Irish American. Um, but most of the Catholics in the Wisconsin area at that time were all German. Okay. And so the seminary was taught in their primary language, which was German, or in Latin, the language of the church. Hmm. So his classes were in German or Latin. And and remember, he didn't finish, he didn't go to high school. Right. Yeah. So when he enters the diocesan seminary, he stuck back into high school with boys who are much, much younger than him. Because he would have been, what, in his 20s at this point? Right, right, 21 when he, when he first started. Wow. And and he was well-liked. The the younger uh, boys, men mm -hmm. at the seminary, really looked up to him. Right. Um, but academics was never going to be his strong point, at least not in different languages. Right, yeah. Um, and, and so he was a C student. And Which is not a bad grade. I mean, it's average. Not a bad grade, but in those I mean, days... I always tell my students... If that's all you can do, that's great. But they looked at it differently in a seminary. <laughs> and they said, you know, if you're going to be a priest yeah. in America at this time, you got to be better than a C. Okay. And so they actually uh, asked him to leave the seminary. They said, we think you probably have a religious vocation. Maybe try monastic orders, but 
not going to make it as a diocesan priest. Hmm. And that was just devastating for him because he he heard this call. Like he heard God say, hey, I want you to be a priest. And yet the church around him was saying no. So at this point, he throws in the towel and he says, forget it. I'm just going to go be a trolley driver forever, right? Well, thankfully, he had some good friends oh, who good. encouraged him <laughs> to uh, to write to religious communities. And actually, it was interesting. I think this was the beginning of Blessed Solanus' spirituality because he, he always would tell people, whatever happens in life, yeah. God works for the good. And if we trust God, if we let him work in our trials and our joys, he's going to work everything out okay. And he really saw this sort of as a, as God had a bigger plan mm-hmm. and he had to trust him. Mm-hmm. And the next step, which he was encouraged by friends, was, well, write to religious communities. Maybe you're meant to go there. So he wrote to the Franciscans, the Jesuits, and the Capuchins. Um, asking, and the Capuchins are Franciscans, but they're a special. Right, okay. right. So they're they're a particular kind of Franciscan. Okay. And the one community he knew he did not want to be a part of was the Capuchins because they were also German speaking in that area at the time. Mm-hmm. And he just been kicked out of seminary, being right. not knowing enough German. So right. that was the one he kind of like in his own mind had ruled out. Right. But he wrote to all three of them. Okay. And he received a favorable response from all three of them. So he prayed on a vena to Our Lady. And on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, he said he heard Our Lady say, go to Detroit. And this was an audible voice. Yes, at least of some kind. It was just very clear. He couldn't deny it. Go to Detroit. And Detroit was the headquarters of the Capuchins. Um, Which is still there today, which which is what we went to go visit. Yes, and that's where his his shrine is. Um, So he went there. And he said when he got there, it was was Christmas time when he arrived. Mm -hmm. And he looked at the monastery grounds. and, And Detroit in winter is, well... Described it for in winter. It's it's cold. It's gray. It's miserable. <laughs> yeah, and that's and, and that's pretty much what he thought. And yeah. he said, "Why am I here? Like, yeah. what what are you thinking, God?" And he felt zero desire to be yeah. a Capuchin. He was exhausted, and he said the next couple of weeks he still felt zero desire to be a Capuchin. Um, three weeks after he entered, he was supposed to formally receive the habit and and really become a part of the Capuchins. And he was just debating within himself the entire time. Is this really God's will? I don't feel anything. I don't particularly want to be here. So how did he know then? I mean, because if I was feeling that way, I'd probably be like, this is stupid. You know what I mean? Like, just, I need to get out. This obviously isn't God's will. And I think he said he couldn't deny that he knew in his previous prayer he'd been told to go to Detroit. And so he decided to go ahead and receive the habit Uh as an act of trust. And when he did, he said from that moment, he just felt peace. Like he never again doubted mm-hmm. once he like made that that leap of faith to trust right. that God would give him the grace. And, and, and God did. Um, so here he is, newly ordained novice, gets sent back to seminary. Um, in German. In German and in Latin still. And he's still a C student. Um, and that caused a lot of problems among his local superiors. Um, in, in fact, both before he made his first vows and then his final vows, he had to sign a formal document, which is, sounds kind of horrible, but he, but he had to say, I'm a meager student. I lack academic abilities. If I'm never ordained a priest, I understand and I accept I'm here to be a Capuchin, not necessarily to be a priest. Whatever my superiors decide, I accept as God's will. Well, could you um, imagine that today? Yeah. I mean... That just wouldn't happen. But 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 for him, yeah. it was this great sign of of trust. Yeah. Whatever whatever God wills, that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to yeah. do God's will, not my own. That's beautiful. Um, and so they eventually did decide to ordain him. And actually, when we when we visited the shrine, the chapel has this huge uh, painting of Saint Francis receiving the stigmata, and oh, I was yeah. in the church when he was ordained as as well. Oh, really? Just kind of that. Kind of kind of cool. Um, but when they decided to ordain him. The headquarters of the Capuchins in Rome, so of all all of the different Capuchin mm-hmm. communities, had given the permission for Solanus to be ordained with no restrictions, like any other priest. But the local superior said his German's still bad. He still has a speech impediment. We're not comfortable with him doing all the things a normal priest would do. Mm-hmm. So they restricted his priesthood. It was called a, a priest simplex, where he could not give homilies at mass and he could not hear confessions. Um, so he was just going to be doing, he would say the mass, he was a priest, mm-hmm. but he was going to be doing lesser jobs. Right. And that's where uh, we tended to hear of him because the main his main work then was to be a doorkeeper mm-hmm. where he would answer the doors and, and bring in guests. Yeah, and uh, 
the guests, I mean, the pictures show they were lines and lines of people just waiting to see him. Yeah. Yeah. And they would describe like they would normally have like five, ten guests a day. And then right. Father Solanus would show up and they would have 200 guests a day yeah, yeah. Every, everywhere that he went. Um, and that's where he became really well known because mm -hmm. people would come to him. And they'd ask for prayers. And he had a, a very uh, common response to everyone. It was, yeah. well, thank God ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is you're asking, thank God for it. And whatever he's going to answer, whether it's a yes or no, it's going to be good. Mm -hmm. And so as a sign of your gratitude, do something to show God that you appreciate his answer. Yeah. And so we'd ask people to either attend mass more or to work in the soup kitchen or say a couple prayers or direct mm -hmm. to the mission. Something concrete to right. show they were grateful. Yeah. So thank God ahead of time. Show them in your actions. Mm -hmm. And then see what God does. One story, sister, I loved when we were there. We met... Um, brother Richard Merling. Yes. And he was telling us a story. He knew Father Solanus. His family knew Father Solanus when he was young. And his brother had been in a serious car accident and they thought they'd have to amputate his leg. And if you remember, brother um, Richard said that he and his mom went to go see Father Solanus about this and just, you know, begged him for healing. And those stories were so common with yeah. Father Solanus. And what I also loved is Brother Richard, who watched his brother be healed, yeah. joined the same community, yeah. and then was later made the vice postulator for yeah, the cause. So he had exactly. a key role in, in helping yeah. Blessed Solanus Casey yeah. be And that was the vice postulator for his beatification, right? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Um, some other neat stories, just because just there, there's um, actually, there's so many. By, the time, by the time Father Solanus died, there were seven notebooks, over 6,000 recorded miracles, prayers answered just through his intercession. So, wow. I mean, the, the miracle. And I, that wasn't even like, all of them, though. No, no. And I mean, everyone, everyone has a miracle story yeah. uh, uh, with him. Tell um, the story. I'm sorry. Tell the story with just with the notebooks that um, because Father Solanus was only writing these down because he was asked to by his superiors. Yes. yes. But then as he was getting older. It was getting harder for him, I believe, right? And so one of the other friars was kind of asked to continue writing these down. And what happened with and that? And what was fun was so the secretary was like, there's there's too many miracles. And so he began throwing them away. Because <laughs> he was like, I don't want to keep all of these miracles. Like, yeah. they're all kind of the same. Like, every yeah. time he prays, they get answered. So like, <laughs> he stopped even recording the miracles she was supposed to be doing because they, they were just too many. Too many of them. Um can I tell the ice cream miracle? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's one of I my favorite one. because it's just... This is probably one of the most famous, too. Yes, but it's, yeah. yes. So one of the, the novices mm -hmm. had had a root canal done 10 years before he entered the monastery. They thought everything was fine. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, he's now a novice. He's starting to have problems in his, in his tooth. He goes to the dentist, and it turns out where the work was done had gotten infected under, under the gums. And they were trying, so there's pus, it's, it's gross, they're trying to drain it. And it becomes That's really awesome. clear the infection has gone down to the bone. And the dentist tries everything he can, and he finally says, you know what, it's eaten away at the bone. The only thing we can do right now is surgery. And that was going to remove part of the jawbone, replace it. So it was a really big deal. Yeah. Um, and especially, again, in those times, it's even bigger. Yeah. And unfortunately, if a novice had a major surgery... It meant he would have had to have left the community, and the community just didn't have the means to pay for that kind of thing. And right. so when the brother came back to the monastery, he was just devastated because he was seeing his vocation, his future, yeah. just drastically change. Yeah. And Father Solana sees him and, and realizes he's really upset, and he asks the novice, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. And the novice explains the situation to him. And Father Solana says, well, you know, why don't you kneel down and let me pray? And so the brother kneels down, and Father Solana puts his hand on the jawbone. And he just prays. And when he finished praying, he looks at the brother and says, you know, I think your dentist is going to be surprised. I don't <laughs> think you need to worry about this anymore. And the brother said that immediately after the prayers happened, he felt he was healed. Like he knew it was taken care of. He went back to the dentist and sure enough, nothing was there. And the dentist was so flabbergasted that he made the brother come back four or five times because he wanted to keep checking. He couldn't believe sure. it was it was really all gone. Yeah. And after the last time where he gave the official okay, like you were you were a hundred percent better, the novice came back to tell Father Solanus Casey the good news. Now Father Solanus is sitting at his desk, the one that I got to sit at and yes. touch and okay, and what happened? So he's at his desk. Well Earlier that day, as he's receiving visitors to the monastery, someone uh -huh. wanted to thank Father Solanus. And so he bought Father Solanus some ice cream. 
But Father Solanus was really busy, so he stuffs the ice cream into his desk. And it's Detroit. It's the summertime. summertime. It's humid. hot, humid, no air conditioning. And one of the other brothers witnessed it. And he thought, Father Solanus is going to forget about it. It's going to be melted. That ice cream is going to be ruined. And he was feeling kind of like this is a really sad occasion because it's, it's ice cream and it's just been destroyed in the desk of Father Solanus. And I really wanted to oh, – we tried opening the drawers because I wanted to like just kind of see if there's still the <laughs> – You know, <laughs> they're all locked up though. But, but, yeah. but in any case, the other brother saw it. Yeah. Um, fast forward several hours. The novice has returned. He's telling the good news to Father Solanus. And Father Solanus says, this calls for a celebration. <laughs> and he opens up his desk drawer and pulls out the ice cream, perfectly frozen. God can work to the extent that we allow him to work. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like St. Peter walking on the water, yeah. when we stop trusting God, we sink. Yeah. And part of, part of the reason we don't see more miracles is because we don't have the faith for them to happen. But then when we surrender our lives to God, when we trust him, God can do so much in our lives. And that's what I think Blessed Solana showed over and over and yeah. over again. Not that God always does what we want. He doesn't. Yeah. Sometimes sometimes the, the better answer is no. Yeah. Um, but if we're willing to allow God to work in our life, if we expect the miracle, yeah. they really do happen. And it's funny, you know, you say that, and that's something that's very striking to me because um, Father Solanus, I mean, all intents and purposes, there really wasn't anything special about him. He was just an ordinary man. You know, if anything, because of his high voice and his terrible violin playing, you know, there was a lot to poke fun at, you know. Yes. And yet here emerges this man, this priest, who just trusts in God and all these great miracles happen. And um, it just, to me, that really speaks to the fact that you know, that's possible for each and every one of us, you yeah. know, and he he taught the people that as they were coming to him in line, you know, yeah, you can, <laughs> you, God desires to give you what you want in accord with his will. You know, yeah. he desires to give that. He desires our happiness. And I think Father Solanus is a real good, you know, example of that. Um, and, I, and I like, too, that Father Solanus has such a blend between prayer and action. Yeah. So, like, people talk about his his deep prayer life. Yeah. The brothers would say often in the morning they would come to the chapel. Right. And they would they would find Father Solanus asleep on the altar, like the, the wooden steps of the altar. Yeah. And actually, one of the brothers told this cute story. Oh, your Brother Richard. Right? Brother Richard, yes. Yeah. That that Father, they would wake Father Solanus up in the morning and say, oh, Father, you shouldn't be sleeping on this hard wood. And he would kind of laugh and say, oh, I slept on the soft side of the wood. <laughs> Uh, but but he had this rich prayer life, and they right. and they would catch him in prayer and contemplation. So it was, it was founded on this personal, real relationship. Yeah. But he also was very, very practical. Mm -hmm. um, so he lives during the Great Depression. He's actually responsible for the first soup kitchens that came into Detroit. Oh wow! And the two biggest soup kitchens that are still in existence in Detroit are successors of the soup kitchen he, he founded. Um, now, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understood that um, when Brother Richard was talking to us in the very spot that we were talking to him in the little courtyard is where the very first soup kitchen was. And then um, when the, you know, after his death, et cetera, et cetera, they had to move that. And so they moved it across the street. Yes. Um, but it's, it's I, I think it's like the same, I mean, at least Brother Richard made it sound like that, that they just like, you know, and put it down. Is Am I right in that? I think so, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. So, and, and what's also beautiful is the spot where the old soup kitchen was. Mm -hmm. um, they've turned into the shrine today. And Father Solanus's tomb, which pilgrims come and pray at and can mm -hmm. visit today, is right where that soup kitchen was. Yeah. So even in his death... He's still feeding people. He's yeah. he's still there giving, um, and and there were great miracles that happened there too. Yeah. And one, again, another another favorite story of mine. Uh, during the depression, they ran out of food, and there were three hundred people still in line, and so they went and they grabbed Father Solanus and said, "Help! What do we do? They're mm -hmm. all waiting for for bread. We don't have anything." Father Solanus came over and he said to everyone. God loves us. We just have to trust our Father. He's not yeah. going to let us starve. And he let everyone in praying be our Father. And when he finished, a truck pulled up full of food for the last 300 men. Wow. And and they said that some of them were just crying tears down their face. But it was just that confidence that God's here. He's yeah. here in very practical, ordinary things, whether it be ice cream or food. And he's here in our prayer life. And he's 
He's present yeah. in, in all things. Yeah. The feeding of the 300. <laughs> yes. Um, the other thing is, I was going to ask, is um, his death. Now, the reason I, I bring this up is because we had the great opportunity of going into the little chapel where he said his last yes. mass. The day, I think it was the day before he died or the day of. I'm not really sure. I can't remember which. But um, what what were the circumstances surrounding his death? And Yes. So he's working as a doorkeeper. And he was getting a lot older and it was mm -hmm. becoming more and more difficult. Actually, kind of a cute, a cute story of him is as he became harder and harder to see guests, when he would get tired, he would duck <laughs> under his desk and lie there and take a 15, 20 minute cat nap and then pop back up when he was ready to, to and see we, people. And we tried that. Yes. And it, as in, I mean, I'm much younger than 80 years old. And just the idea of him crouching under that desk, I was like, wow, he, first of all, he was really tiny. And secondly... He could sleep anywhere. Yeah, he could <laughs> sleep anywhere and in any position. But that was kind of a sign to the brothers. Right. You know, it's time for him to retire. We, right. need, we need to not have him be doorkeeper. Yeah. So they moved him to New York. But within literally days of his coming, there were just many people in New York coming to see him. So then they moved him to Huntington, Indiana, which was more secluded, but people were still making pilgrimages yeah. down to see him. And his last years of his life was kind of a letter writing apostolate, but he was more protected. Right. Um, but he got more and more elderly and he had a terrible skin uh, condition. And so they moved him back to Detroit to the hospital and, and, and into hospice, really, for the last year of his life um, for a lot of a lot of that time. And they were trying not to let anyone know that he he was returned. Yeah. But in his last days, they knew he was reaching the end. It was time to put him into the hospital. And so his last mass was in that room and they they saved oh, his vestments. Yeah. Um, and which and we what, also got to which see. We also got to see. Yeah. Yes. Um, but finally he was, he was in the hospital and the nurses just loved him there. And mm -hmm. he, he just had such a profound faith and they'd ask him, where does it hurt? And he'd say all over, but praise God, our Lord suffered this too. I wish I could suffer um, like that. You know, so, so just, <laughs> just, just this, yeah. this peace. And his last words, actually, a nurse was holding him in her arms. She had uh, actually giving him a bath, but she had him in her arms. Mm -hmm. And she said, he sat up and he looked up towards the heaven and he said, I give my soul to Jesus Christ. Those were the last words that he uttered before before he died. Oh, so beautiful. just this, this beautiful, peaceful death. Yeah. And then after his death, people began making pilgrimages to his tomb. And the miracles kept happening. He, he wasn't just a witness of trust right. while he lived. He continued to be that witness even, yeah. even after he's gone. Because, of course, he, he continues to live in heaven. Right. In absolutely. Absolutely. So what is the takeaway from him? If you were to say it like in one sentence... Confidence. Confidence and trust in God. I was going to say, that's only one word, but <laughs> confidence and trust in God. Yes. And, and just thank God. Thank yeah. God ahead of time and expect miracles. Yeah. Because God will work many. Well, thanks be to God. All right. Well, blessed Solanus Casey. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.